Bright headlights pierced a heavy layer of snowflakes, a scientist walks through the sleet, wrapped as warmly as possible, two other guys, dressed in identical black cold-weather outfits, approach the scientist, he brings them to an excavation site the size of a football field, with a massive wing and fuselage visible in the center, the guys in black sliced through the fuselage of the mysterious craft and entered. They discover the wreckage of a gigantic, frozen spacecraft within, when one of the soldiers wipes away the snow, he notices a gleaming red, white, and blue shield encased in ice. Norway, Tunsberg, 1942. As their village is overtaken by Nazis, two custodians for an old Viking ruin listen, suddenly, the front door bursts wide, letting in a swarm of Nazi operatives, one of the caregivers is killed in the explosion, and the other begs the troops to leave him alone, they ignore the old guy and proceed to unlock the building's crypts one by one, they arrive upon a sarcophagus with a lid that is too hefty to raise. In the exploded entrance, a shadowy figure appears. Johann Schmidt, a high-ranking Nazi and the leader of the Hydra group, comes casually. He walks across the room to the difficult-to-open tomb and effortlessly pushes the lid open, he discovers the skeleton bones of an elderly Viking clutching a glass cube within, Schmidt is begged to leave by the caretaker, Schmidt scoffs, claiming that if this cube weren't a forgery, it would be the crown treasure of Odin's treasury, he crushes it on the floor and asks the caretaker where the actual cube is, the caretaker first refuses, but when threatened with damage to his family, he relents. Motioning to a concealed drawer across the room, which is part of an old sculpture the size of the wall, Schmidt prists the drawer apart to reveal the genuine, illuminating cube hidden within, Schmidt tells his soldiers to bomb the city before shooting the unfortunate caretaker. Steve Rogers, a twenty-something asthmatic weighing ninety pounds and standing five feet tall, is anxiously awaiting the opportunity to register in the United States Army at a recruitment facility in Brooklyn. The army doctor examines Steve's medical dossier, which reads like that of a ninety-year-old man, and rejects Steve's application as the military 4F, as this is his fourth unsuccessful enlistment attempt. Steve goes to the movies, he envies the enlisted guys depicted in the pre-show newsreel and observes as other members of the crowd cry, a rowdy, impatient moviegoer starts shouting at the screen, begin the movie. I didn't pay to witness this nonsense. When Steve orders the man to stop talking, the man turns around, gets up, and towers over him, the bully violently beats the tiny Steve in the alley behind the theater, who courageously fights back but is soon defeated, when his opponent questions why he isn't just giving up, the bleeding Steve responds, I can do this all day. Steve's best buddy, James Bucky Barnes, rushes to the alley, he quickly kicks the bully away and attends to Steve, who is irritated that Bucky arrived and took rid of the bully just as Steve was regaining his strength, Bucky has been enlisted, his application was approved, and he was sent to the 107th Infantry Division. Bucky asks Steve to go dancing with a couple of females on a double date in a joyous atmosphere, Steve reluctantly follows, the four travel to Queens for the World's Fair, while Bucky canoodles with his dates, Steve observes Playboy inventor Howard Stark's failed demonstration of a flying automobile, Steve leaves the group to visit another recruitment station. Bucky approaches him and inquires as to how Steve intends to fabricate his application this time, Dr. Abraham Erskine, who happens to be walking by, overhears their chat, he is captivated by Steve's audacity. Bucky bids Steve luck with his current application, and Steve enters the recruiting station for his fifth physical, inside, Steve sits on an examination table, growing apprehensive as an MP and Dr. Erskine approach the room. All of Steve's previous applications are on file with Dr. Erskine, concerned about Steve's unsuccessful applications, Erskine puts his character to the test by asking if his desire to kill Nazis drives his determination on seeking for military service, the young guy truly admits that he is not a murderer at heart, but that he dislikes bullies of any provenance. He also displays no worry when Erkstein discloses that he is German by birth, Erkstein approves Steve's newest application after being won over by his strong resolve and persistent belief. Johann Schmidt delivers the glowing cube to Dr. Arnim Zola, his hydro-weapon specialist, at a secret military station high in the Alps. Schmidt and Dr. Zola are able to power unstoppable energy weapons and cannons because to the cube's seemingly endless power. Meanwhile, Steve has been recruited in basic training, 
where he will be closely monitored by Dr. Erskine and Colonel Chester Phillips, he and his battalion are informed that they are eligible for the government's newest super-soldier program, Phillips is dissatisfied with Steve and is irritated by Dr. Erskine's interest in him, during basic training, Steve encounters Peggy Carter, a gorgeous but determined Britty SH officer who appears to pity him, despite being the smallest and weakest member. Of the platoon, Steve demonstrates the most spirit, selflessness, and ingenuity, particularly when his platoon is tasked with retrieving a flag from the top of a tall pole, as the other, more fit men in the company fail the task one by one as they try to climb the pole, Steve casually pulls the pin holding it up, taking the flag when the pole crashes to the ground, Phillips, still skeptical, throws a grenade into the group during exercises, scattering them all. Phillips is taken aback when Steve dives on top of it alone, eager to sacrifice himself to save the others, only. To learn that the grenade was a fake, Erskine's judgment is accepted by Phillips. Dr. Erskine speaks with Steve that evening, Dr. Erskine explains that this is not his first time doing this experiment over a bottle of schnapps, he narrates a narrative about Johann Schmidt ordering him to make a serum that would give a man godlike power prior to his departure to the United States, Dr. Erskine developed a preliminary version of the serum he wants to use on Steve, but when Schmidt injected himself, his flesh rusted away, leaving him as a sinewy crimson skeleton, despite the danger, Steve decided to go forward with the treatment. The next morning, Steve and Peggy drive across Brooklyn, stopping in front of an old antique shop, Steve points off numerous locations of Brooklyn where he's been beaten up along the road, she inquires as to why he has never fled, he adds that fleeing was, in his opinion, an invitation to more assault. The two enter the antique shop, swap passcodes with an elderly woman working the register, and descend into a hidden military bunker, Peggy leads Steve to the center of the bunker, where they discover Dr. Erskine and Howard Stark constructing a medical capsule, and Colonel Phillips rubbing shoulders with senators and dignitaries, Steve is instructed to remove his shirt and sit in the capsule, according to Stark. The process will begin with the injection of muscle regenerators into Rogers. Primary muscle groups, which will then be assaulted with Vita rays. Erskine has made no secret of Steve's suffering, but he assures he'll emerge stronger, Carter wishes Steve well before joining Phillips in the overhead viewing room, Steve is encased within the Vita Ray capsule after Erskine's serum is infused into his muscles, the capsule shines brilliantly, Steve shouts in pain but encourages them to keep going, and the treatment is finished fast, when the capsule is turned off. Steve emerges a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier, with substantial muscle. Yet these are only the most superficial features of his physique that have been artificially boosted to human potential. Everyone, including Phillips, rejoices at the procedure's success and descends from the viewing chamber to congratulate Erskine, a lone dignitary, Heinz Kruger, a German spy, remains behind, placing a little bag on a chair, the watching gallery erupts moments later, Dr. Erskine is fatally shot twice by Kruger as he descends the stairs, he quickly murders the guards and runs into the streets, with Peggy hot on his tail. Steve attends to Dr. Erskine, who has just enough energy to point at Steve's heart before passing away, Steve flees the bunker in pursuit of Kruger. Peggy chases Kruger down the street and easily kills his getaway driver, Kruger grabs a cab and plans to run Peggy over, Steve arrives just in time to save her from being hit by an incoming taxi, Steve chases the cab on foot, sprinting faster than a normal human, and without the tiredness that a healthy guy would experience, he hops onto the roof of the cab, dodges Kruger's bullets, and the two crash land in the Brooklyn docks. Kruger fires at Steve, who is shielded by the star-imprinted door. Of the destroyed taxi, Kruger runs to his Hydra submarine, which dives beneath as Steve approaches. Steve follows the sub, smashes a hole in the cockpit glass, and pulls Kruger to the surface, Kruger informs Steve that he is the first of many, that Rogers can cut off one head, but two more will replace it, he then murders himself with a cyanide pill secreted in a false tooth, exclaiming one final, Heil Hydra, before passing out.